Alrighty, I have the time as being 12 noon, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you to those that are joining us for today's webinar. Uh, today's webinar is titled Thinking Beyond Skip the Straw. Just a heads up for those that were not on last week's webinar, um, as participants, you are all muted, but if you wish to ask a question, you can communicate with us, the panelists, by using the chat box. So if you type questions in there, um, we will try and address anything that is time sensitive as we are doing the webinar, and most questions we'll be addressing at the end of the webinar. Um, Let's see, we are recording this webinar, so it will be available online starting later this afternoon, once I've had a chance to download it and put it up into YouTube. And if you are registered for the webinar, which apparently you are since you're joining us, you'll get an email tomorrow with the link to the webinar. Alrighty. So as those of you that joined us last week uh, are already aware, my name is Maya McGuire. I work for the University of Florida, Florida Sea Grant. I'm an extension agent. And about three years ago, I started a project called the Florida Microplastic Awareness Project. And this marks the third year that we have promoted the month of September as Microplastic Awareness Month. So we have uh, various things going on, including a webinar series. Um, of which this is the second of three webinars. We will have a third one next Thursday, also at noon Eastern time. If you wish to join us then, we'd be happy to have you. Um, so I mentioned my name. Let me go back a slide. I'm Maya McGuire. I do have two other folks joining me as presenters or on the as panelists today. We have Dr. Lisa Krimsky, who like me, works for Florida Sea Grant and University of Florida. Uh, she's going to be helping moderate the chat box and uh, keep us all on track. And then I have Stu, Har sorry, Stu Harris from the American Chemistry Council, and he's going to be presenting the majority of the webinar today. So I'm going to handle the first few slides, and then I'll be turning things over to Stu. Having said that, I'd like to find out a little bit about those of you that are joining us on the webinar. So I'm going to launch a very short poll here. If you can just kind of click on the appropriate response, I would appreciate it. I'll give you a few seconds to do that. All right, looks like folks have answered that. Thank you very much. I appreciate getting that information. All right. So let's move on to the webinar. So when it was suggested to me that the topic for one of the webinars be thinking beyond skip the straw, um, that got me thinking a little bit because skip the straw is kind of a, a current trend, but my interest in microplastics and sort of plastic awareness began about 2010 or so. Um, and the focus at that time was more on microbeads, the awareness about these plastic microbeads that were found in personal care products, having the potential to end up in the environment was kind of a new thing and a little bit alarming to a lot of folks. So it was interesting, it's interesting now to see kind of some parallels with what happened in, in the early 2010s, um, focused on microbeads rather than straws. In the mid 2010s, around 2014, we had some states in, in the US starting to ban the sale of cosmetics containing plastic microbeads, and that really got rolling. And after about eight or nine states had passed legislation at the state level, the federal government very quickly moved uh, a bill through the House and the Senate, and then it was signed into law by the president in December of 2015. And that is now called the Microbead Free Waters Act of 2015. The US 
was the first country to, to really apply that. Many other countries have since passed similar laws, in some cases trying to maybe make them a little bit stricter. Um, one of the limitations of the Microbead Free Waters Act here in the U.S. is its very specific wording. So what does the Microbead Free Waters Act do? It bans the inclusion of solid plastic particles that are less than five millimeters in size from being found in rinse-off cosmetics that are designed to exfoliate or cleanse the human body or parts thereof, including toothpaste. So it does explicitly include toothpaste, but what isn't covered in this act are the non-rinse-off cosmetics so that are designed to clean, basically clean the, the body. Um, so there are still a lot of makeup products, deodorants, some body lotions that still legally can be sold in the U.S. even though they have plastic particles in them. Uh, it also allows for rinse-off cosmetics to have hollow plastic particles that are less than five millimeters in size. So there are some issues with it. It does not completely ban plastics from being in personal care products, but it is a good step. Um, the prohibit on sale of these products went into effect July 1st of this year. Um, so it's a, a relatively recent thing, but at this point in stores, uh, it is in effect. Okay, so thinking ahead a few years, thinking to the, the present time, um, we've had an upswell of, of different pledges, campaign efforts. A lot of these are youth-led, which is really awesome. Um, we're seeing businesses, we're seeing municipalities imposing bans on everything from straws to bags to food containers. And it's wonderful. Awareness is really growing. Um, and there are a lot of these efforts largely focused on individual behaviors. Um, the images, the, the sort of the, the campaigns that I've posted on the slide are by no means meant to be comprehensive. Um, this is just kind of a smattering of some of the ones maybe that had kind of cool logos that I could grab and put on the slide. Um, so I'm not meaning to slight anybody by not including them. There are many, many, many efforts all around the world um, trying to, to do essentially the same thing, make people more aware about plastic waste and find ways, encourage people to adopt behaviors that will reduce the plastic waste that they generate. Uh, in, back in March, we had the International Marine Debris Conference in San Diego, and one of the guest speakers there was a, a teenage girl from Bali, um, and she, her name is Malati. I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce her last name, but Malati was a, a very powerful speaker, and she told us about her efforts. Her and her sister are partnering to try and raise awareness about plastic waste in Indonesia and trying to get some legislation passed there. Um, so it's, it's wonderful seeing the youth get so involved and actually have some very good successes with that. So I'm curious to find out if any of you have taken a pledge. So I've got a very short poll here. Just curious, have you personally taken a pledge promising to take some sort of action, any sort of action, to reduce plastic waste? And I see a trend here. <laughs> All right. So everybody has jumped on that bandwagon. Awesome. Um, hopefully you're also encouraging others to do that. I know we have some educators on the, the webinar today. Well, it's great to know. So some of you might have seen uh, this article by Matt Prindeville. Um, it's been circulating on social media quite a bit in, in recent weeks. And it also kind of raises the question, what can we do beyond these individual actions? The individual actions are great, but they're not going to be the the final solution. Um, there is no single best answer 
for helping eliminate plastic waste. Um, every thing that is, is proposed has benefits to it, but may also have costs associated with it. Um, the article has some, it sort of suggests the need for behavioral and cultural changes and gives some examples of business level efforts uh, to reduce the plastic waste, to promote reusable, returnable, shareable type of, of containers, thinking like restaurant industry. Um, but again, there are costs and benefits for the businesses, for the environment, for people with, with every action. So it's an interesting question to mull over. What's the next best step? What else can be being done? There are a number of programs in place for businesses, opportunities for businesses. So Surfrider has a, a program they call the Ocean Friendly Restaurant Program. There is a Green Restaurant Association that has a certification program. EPA has a program called WasteWise. Uh, there's Green America's Green Business Network. There are green lodging programs in many states. Most of these seem to be state uh, focused. And all of these different programs provide checklists, if you will, of actions that businesses can take. And in many cases, they have certain required actions and then certain optional actions. And you have to do all of the required things and a certain percentage of the optional things in order to receive the certification and then the organization may help promote your business as a certified business um, there may be resources available to you um, all of those sorts of things so we're starting to see and some of these have been around for for several years um, efforts or projects that are available for for businesses for corporations to look into to encourage them to similarly work on reducing the amount of plastic waste that they produce. So what about the plastic industry? Well, this is why Stu's on the phone. Um, he's gonna provide us some input from the American Chemistry Council, uh, which is representing plastics industry. And at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and turn over the, the audio to him. So, Stu, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself. Thank you, Maya. And I will queue up your first slide, and we'll take it away. Great. Well, thank you again, and I appreciate the opportunity to, um, to be on the webinar today. Um, I have a number of slides, uh, and trying to stick to the, um, the limited time that we have available, my intention is to run through a few of them quickly. Um, but I thought there were some good um, background slides that would be helpful to, um, to set the stage for where the industry is coming from in terms of addressing marine debris um, and plastic uh, waste uh, in general. Uh, so this captures our view uh, that plastic and other uh, litter in the environment is unacceptable. Uh, I would hope that that's widely shared across, across the uh, audience today. Um, we do believe that plastics deliver significant benefits to society, um, but those benefits are lost. Uh, if plastic litter harms the, uh, the natural environment. Next slide, please. Uh, back in 2014, uh, a group called True Cost did a study for the UN Environment Program on the environmental cost of plastics. Um, in 2016, True Cost updated that report to look um, at uh, the environmental cost of plastic and the environmental cost of alternatives. Um, and what they found was uh, the cost of alternatives to plastic uh, used in packaging specifically uh, is about four times that of alternatives. Uh, what's interesting is the environmental cost of plastic versus alternatives on a per unit basis is relatively similar. Um, however, the amount of plastic that's, that's needed to perform whatever the required function is um, as a package, whether it's protecting food or, um, or other uh, applications is significantly less. Uh, and so because of the very, very small amount of material that's used, uh, you end up with significant um, cost savings in terms of environmental impacts of, uh, of plastics over alternatives. Next slide, please. So one of the 
one of the aspects of plastics, and, and we've all seen the various packaging used at the grocery store. Um, you know, the first time I saw a cucumber wrapped in plastic, I kind of wondered why anyone would, would do that. Um, and then I dug into it a little bit further, and I've got a teenager, so I find myself at the grocery store quite a bit, um, trying to keep food in the house. Um, and we have a small grocery store. They get deliveries um, usually once a week. Uh, at the beginning of the week, usually on Tuesdays, they get their uh, their vegetables in, and the cucumbers all look great. Uh, but when I'm back at the grocery store toward the end of the week, uh, they look terrible, and, and they're really unsellable. And the reason for that is is a cucumber in particular is about 96% water. Um, and once you pick it, it starts to lose that water. And after about three days on the shelf, uh, it, it really can't be sold anymore because it's uh, lost so much water. Um, by wrapping it in a very thin film of, of plastic, you're able to um, maintain that the water within the cucumber and extend its shelf life. Uh, and so there are a lot of benefits, uh, especially in areas where it's more difficult to get food to or you need um, have longer distances to travel. Next slide, please. Uh, everyone is familiar. I would. Oh, can you go back one? Thank you. Uh, hopefully, everyone's familiar with this. Um, the data in this. I don't know if everyone has seen this specific uh, representation, but the Wall Street Journal did a nice job of um, of graphing or of of displaying uh, the data from Jenna Jambeck's 2015 um, paper on sources of marine debris. Um, and, and what she found really was that uh, lack of waste management infrastructure in rapidly developing economies in the Asia Pacific region uh, were the primary source of uh, plastic leaking into the ocean. Um, countries such as the U.S. and many European countries, which have higher per capita uh, plastic consumption, but also have far more developed waste management infrastructure, um, were very low on the list. The U.S. ranked uh, 20th on the list. The coastal European, uh, the coastal EU countries were 18th. Next slide, please. Sorry, it's freezing. Do you want me to try to? Uh, let me. Stop sharing for just a second and try resharing and see if this will work. So, okay. Yeah. Sorry, Stu, I'm having technical okay. difficulties. Do we have any questions for Stu while we're waiting? My, if we saw, okay. So if we still okay. have problems. I think we're back okay. working again. So the, looking at uh, the sources of marine debris um, and the, this idea of um, a lack of waste management infrastructure in developing economies as one of the primary sources. Uh, the, the global industry has, has come together to find ways to address marine debris. Um, back in 2011, even, even before the Jambic paper, there was a recognition by the industry of the, the growing importance uh, of marine debris and the need for industry to take an active role in addressing that. Uh, and so at the fifth International Marine Debris Conference, uh, a number of uh, organizations came together within the plastics industry uh, to create a global declaration. Uh, next slide, please. So since 2011, um, that group has grown. <laughs> um, that group has grown from the original 47 uh, members with um, 100 projects in six different categories to address marine debris um, to our most recent report, which came out at the end of uh, 2017 with 74 members uh, in 40 countries with 355 projects. Uh, so we continue as as the, the associations that represent different parts of the plastics industry, we continue to take an active role in supporting projects 
uh, to reduce the amount of plastic that's leaking into the ocean. Next slide, please. So getting back to um, the, the Jambeck study, the industry, the plastics industry, has really co coalesced around um, the finding that waste management infrastructure um, really is the key to preventing plastic from leaking into the ocean. Uh, I can go into too much detail, but the the, slide, the picture on the far left is from Washington, D.C. in the summertime, uh, a lot of tourists, um, and we see that an overflowing trash can. Um, the picture in the middle is from a project that we worked on in Hawaii, also of an overflowing trash can by the water. And then the picture on the right is from Washington, D.C., across the street from the first picture um, at one of the Smithsonian uh, facilities, which is privately has privately maintained uh, trash service. And so you see the trash and recycling, they're well maintained, they're not overflowing, um, they're being kept up with, as opposed to the other bins, um, which we're not seeing regular maintenance on those, they're not being emptied in a timely manner, and it, it creates an opportunity for the material to get into the water. Next slide, please. Uh, so, in terms of ACC's partnerships, um, we have a number of partnerships that we've engaged in. This is just a, um, a sampling of those, um, whether it's federal agencies, whether it's state and local government, um, or environmental organizations that we um, that we work with to identify um, and support different projects to reduce marine debris um, and improve recycling, other aspects like that. Next slide, please. We also engage in research. Um, two recent studies, um, we actually provided uh, data to um, Dr. Chelsea Rockman of the University of Toronto, who was working on a modeling study. President and Marine debris could migrate um, out of the plastic and into the water. And so we provided her with some uh, industry data on the types of additives that are present in the most commonly uh, found marine debris. Uh, was whole in the Marine Biological Laboratory um, on a study looking at the breakdown of plastics um, in the environment. So plastic does make it its way into the environment. How do microbes um, form and biofoul on that break down into microplastics? And then how is the microplastic, uh, how are the particles transported through the water column and, and where do they ultimately end up? Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of policy, uh, and Maya mentioned it earlier, the micro Water Act, um, ACC was, was very supportive and engaged in that. Um, we've also been very supportive and engaged in the Save Our Seas Act, which has been bouncing back and forth between the, the House and Senate uh, here in Washington lately as um, various um, unrelated amendments are added to it, since it is a piece of legislation that's moving, but we're hoping it will be sent to the President for signature soon. Um, that program reauthorizes NOAA's Marine Debris Program and also includes a, a few other key um, provisions to help the U.S. in terms of our global efforts to address marine debris. Next slide, please. Uh, the Trash Free Seas Alliance was pulled together uh, by the Ocean Conservancy a number of years ago. Um, recently, uh, ACC uh, joined it. It's a, a coalition of private um, and nonprofit uh, organizations, private sector companies, and also um, NGOs uh, and a few academic organizations uh, that have come together um, under the banner to uh, to address marine debris. Next slide, please. Some of the work of the Trash Free Seas Alliance um, really tears off of the 2015 study by uh, Jenna Jambeck. Um, and then moving from that study, the Ocean Conservancy Commission, uh, the McKinsey Center uh, to to develop a, a report called Stemming the Tide, which looked at how do we address the lack of waste management infrastructure in the rapidly developing economies in Southeast Asia, the top five of which were identified in the Jambeck paper. Uh, following from that, um, the Ocean Conservancy and Trash Free Seas Alliance developed a report called The Next Wave, which looked at how do we finance those types of solutions. We have an infrastructure need, um, but there's also a, a lack of financing available. Uh, and then from that, ACC and the Ocean Conservancy approached the Closed Loop Partners, uh, which is a group up in New York that has the Closed Loop Fund uh, to develop an international version of the Closed Loop Fund uh, called Circulate Capital. Uh, and Circulate Capital is in the process of, of, 
um, collecting funding, um, but it has announced um, its intention to raise $150 million from the private sector to finance waste management infrastructure in developing countries. Next slide, please. And we've got five minutes. Okay. So we'll kind of run through these next ones pretty quickly. Um, I guess my if it's any problems, we can just go to the slide sort of view. Uh, so if you just kind of slow down, so a number of different, and I'll just run through these quickly. Um, ACC has been very engaged in promoting recycling with Keep America Beautiful. Um, uh, also for the next one on enhanced recycling, we work with the Recycling Partnership, uh, which is a group that looks to improve access to recycling. Um, two really neat projects that I want to touch on, the material, the flexible film sortation, the next slide. Um, is the um, material recovery um, for the future is a project, and we actually have a pilot uh, ongoing right now in Pennsylvania to look at um, successfully sorting flexibles. So a lot of the pouches that you get, um, you know, frozen foods and things come in, uh, being able to sort those out of the single stream to create a bale um, of flexible plastics that then could be marketed um, in the recycling market. Um, the next slide on wrap is something that hopefully everyone knows about, um, but your um, grocery bags, dry cleaning bags, um, bread bags, um, other types of over wrap, over soda, and things like that is all made out of um, low density polyethylene film. And that film can be taken back to the store if it's clean and dry. Um, and then it gets recycled into various products, including uh, composite lumber like Trex decking, things like that. Um, the next slide is on Operation Clean Sweep. I'm happy to answer any questions people have about that, but it's a, an industry um, program to eliminate the loss of plastic resin pellets into the environment. And then I, I do want to touch on uh, our sustainability goals. Uh, just spend another minute on this. Uh, recently, ACC uh, came out with um, a sustainability goal that by 2040, 100% of plastic packaging would be reused, recycled, or recovered in the US. Um, we set some interim goals uh, and a best practice goal as well. Uh, but the, the important thing to keep in mind is that, that we are looking, we um, in the US, Canada, and Europe all have adopted uh, similar goals that by 2040, 100% of plastic packaging in those areas would either be reused, um, recycled, or recovered. And by recovered, um, we do get into things like um, uh, depolymerization or paralysis, the, the, the process by which you can take a, a polymer, a plastic, and break it down into its original monomer components. So ethylene, propylene, styrene, things like that. And then you can take that feedstock and, um, and feed it into or, or use it in a chemical um, refining process to make other products, um, whether those be other plastics or other um, other chemistries, you know, would, is yet to be seen. But it's it's something that we are working on um, and uh, working with the industry and working with a number of partners uh, to try to advance that capability in the U.S. and, uh, and abroad. Uh, and so with that, we can uh, turn to questions, Maya, if that works. Sure, and I apologize about those difficulties. It seems to be a problem on my computer's end. So I see we've had some questions in the chat box already. Um, the first one asks, do the numbers in China also reflect what the U.S. sends for recycling? I'm thinking that that was referring to the graphic uh, that was made from the Jambeck et al. paper. Um, yes. Yeah. And so, so that, they, those data were for the year 2010, correct? Yeah, so that data is for 2010, and that is data based on um, World Bank, I, I believe it is, uh, numbers in terms of the amount of plastic that's leaking into the environment. Um, and so it is a good question in terms of what the U.S. sends for recycling to China, and, and I, I would even expand it beyond what the U.S. sends. Um, many countries were sending um, material to China for recycling. And, and so there is um, some component, which I don't know that we can 
that we can tease out of, of the leakage numbers. Um, but material that gets sent to China from developed and developing countries for recycling, um, certainly the residuals from that have the potential to contribute to the amount of, of plastic that's leaking into the ocean uh, because of the lack of, of infrastructure available to, to manage those residuals. Um, there's a later question about China's refusal to take U.S. recycling. Um, it's actually to take global recycling. Um, China has clamped down on all imports of uh, recycling. Um, what are, what's the private sector doing in light of this, and do we have recommendations? Um, so in light of this, the ACC and the plastics recycling and, and other industries, um, the paper industry is affected as well, um, are looking as at this as an opportunity to expand and develop U.S. recycling capability um, and also to clean up the material recovery facility um, sorting process. Um, I mentioned that material recovery for the future project um, and other projects like that. One of the challenges that we have um, with our infrastructure in the United States is the sorting capacity really has not been well maintained and upgraded over time as the as the mix of materials that goes to the sorting facility has changed. Uh, and so we end up getting uh, bales at the end. So, so they take all the material and they bale it up at the end. And a lot of those bales have contamination in them. Uh, and there is an education component to that about what people put in the bin. Um, my wife gives me uh, a hard time almost daily for what does and doesn't go in the bin because I've become more educated on that, but she's not happy about things that she thinks should go in the bin that really shouldn't. Um, but that's a, an aspect of it. The other aspect is, again, the equipment that is used to, to sort those materials to make sure that the end product that comes out of a material recovery facility is clean and can be recycled. Um, in terms of actions Congress can take, probably need a little bit more thought on that. Um, so other questions, there's Maya? A, I don't know there's a question, a question about plastic film. Um, that in Germany, customers can leave plastic film at the store and it gets sent back to manufacturers. And the question is, can we do that in the US? So in, in the US, you can take plastic film to many stores. Um, if the stores have bins that are designated for plastic bag recycling, you can actually take those other, not just the store plastic bags, but those other products that Stu mentioned, like the, the bread bags, the paper towel wrappers, the, essentially any plastic film that you can stretch between your fingers uh, will be that polyethylene film that can be taken back to the stores. And if you do have questions about that, the RAP, um, uh, it's, I think it's filmrecycling.org. I'll work with Maya to get the email or the website for that, which will have more information on that program. There are a couple of questions about um, the recyclable goals uh, for the ACC. So one is what actions are or will be taken to achieve the reduction portion of the 2040 goal by the ACC? Um, we are in the process of, um, of developing the specifics of, of how to achieve that goal. It was something that our members adopted recently. Um, and so at, at the staff level, we are um, really outlining the strategy to get there. Um, but it, it will include things such as uh, finding ways to support upgrades of material recovery facilities, supporting greater access to recycling um, among the population. Ultimately, we're gonna have to have 100% access um, of the population to recycling or recovery um, infrastructure. And so that's gonna require uh, a lot of upgrades and, and a lot of um, outreach. Um, so we are working with our existing partners and we're looking for new partners as well um, to help us get there. And then there's a somewhat related question um, with the goal to have all plastic as recyclable by 2030. What's the current percent that is recyclable? Oh, that's a good question. Um, shoot, I should have looked that number up before I came. Uh, I we can get back you know, to we're gonna, that. yeah, we're going to have to get back to it because I have a colleague that works specifically on recycling and has those statistics right at hand, and I do not.
Okay, there's a question about, um, Stu, can you comment on the downcycling issue? The fact that plastics usually are not actually recycled into the same sort of product that they came from? Yes. Uh, so oftentimes with recycling, and, and a lot of this has to do with the level of contamination of a material, as well as the market for recycled content, um, plastic resin and other materials get recycled into other products. So for example, uh, PET bottles, so soda bottles, water bottles, um, anything that's made out of PET often gets recycled into um, fabric or carpet, um, nylon thread, things like that. Part of the reason for that is there's a very, very strong market for recycled content in those applications. Uh, and so the, the cost of, of the material so, so there's a large pull, there's a large demand in those markets for that specific recycled material. Um, to take a, a soda bottle and recycle it into another soda bottle is feasible. Um, there actually was a project, I think in Atlanta, that was, that was demonstrating that. Uh, but the challenge is um, the amount of washing that was required to ensure that it was a clean stream and could be used again for food grade contact. Um, was much higher. And so there was a higher cost associated with producing this recycled content, this recycled flake that could then be used to make more bottles. Uh, and there was already an existing market that was, um, you know, purchasing the majority of that material. And so it, there are a number of factors that go to it. What's interesting is as we get into more of the, um, the, the feedstock recovery type you know, paralysis operations that I mentioned before. Um, and there's a company in Oregon that's doing this right now. Uh, they're doing it right now with polystyrene because from a chemistry standpoint, it's, it's very easy. Um, although they just announced that they're going to start doing it with polyethylene and polypropylene as well. Um, but they take, uh, you know, foam coffee cups. They take, um, you know, a lot of the cutlery and solo cups and things like that that are made out of polystyrene. Um, and they break it down into styrene oil. And then that styrene oil is purchased by uh, two companies in, in the US that make polystyrene and they're using it to make new polystyrene. And so by taking the, the plastic all the way back to its original monomer, you, you, you eliminate the contamination issues and you can then make a new product, uh, that same product if you wanted, um, out of that, those same monomers. Uh, and, and so that's another aspect uh, that technology is, is providing us with more opportunities to do that. The traditional recycling is you shred up the old plastic, you wash it, you form it into pellets, and then those pellets get used. But oftentimes there's contamination and, you know, the coloring isn't quite right or, or there may be other materials in there that you didn't, um, didn't want because of the sorting process. There are a couple of questions touching on um, the cost of plastic alternatives. Um, one's sort of just bluntly asking, why are the alternatives to plastic so expensive? Is there anything that can be done to bring down the price in the manufacturing of those products to make them more attractive for the public to purchase? So the, you know, the simple answer to that is, is scale. Um, and we have seen things, and, and I know you've got a webinar coming up on it next week with, um, PLA and PHA and, and some of these other um, alternatives to, or alternative polymers to plastic. Um, also, we see bio-based plastics, which is another category. So using sugar cane or sugar beets or other products to make, um, to make plastics. The, the challenge oftentimes is either the cost of the feedstock or simply the scale. Um, and with PHA, there is a, a challenge that there isn't the uh, economy of scale that's been achieved yet, um, but that's certainly something that can, uh, that can change over time. Um, also, in, in terms of the cost of plastics, um, the cost of plastic is often driven by um, either the cost of, of natural gas, which is what we make plastic from in the U.S., uh, or the cost of crude oil, which is what plastic is made from in Europe and, um, and Asia. Or in, in China's case, it's, it's made from coal. But uh, depending on what your feedstock is and, and the economy of scale, that helps drive the, the price. So something that is, is likely to change, um, you know, over the, over the next few years in terms of alternatives.
Okay, I'm still reading through some of the questions. Um, one question says, isn't the takeaway from all of this just that recycling doesn't matter so much as durability? Shouldn't our goal be to move away broadly from single use toward reusable? So that's a good question. Um, in, in terms of, of durability, uh, and one thing that the industry has, has really focused on in the past, and we're seeing a shift in that, um, is performance. And so in the past, the, really the goal was, how can we get a better performing package that's lighter, um, that performs the same function, that uses less material um, to be as, as resource efficient as possible? Uh, but that led us to a lot of materials that were more difficult to recycle because they weren't as durable or they didn't have as much material there to, to extract value from in terms of, of the recycling industry. When we look at reusables and more durable items, there are trade-offs in the sense of um, the weight uh, of those items or the amount of space that they take up. Uh, but we are seeing a shift within the industry, especially within packaging, to um, products that are more easily recycled, um, not necessarily reusable, but we are seeing more of those on the market as well. Uh, so there, there definitely has been a, a response to the, the public interest uh, in terms of trying to make things either more easily recyclable or reusable. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a balance um, that will continue to fluctuate between those two extremes. Okay, there's one comment that I'd like to address that um, basically is, is saying that we should be trying to eat local um, and so shouldn't have to transport food for long distances and therefore it shouldn't need to have the packaging. Um, people should be able to eat their vegetables before they spoil. And, and that's idealistically perfectly true. Um, the reality of it is we have a number of locations in the U.S. and I'm sure in other countries that have been identified as food deserts where it isn't feasible to get local. Uh, there aren't local farms. They can't produce, if there are small farms, they can't produce quantity. Um, so for maybe people can't get to where the, the produce is being made available. So Ideally, yes, we, we would love to all be able to buy local, support local farmers, buy food in season, um, but the reality of it is with the number of people that need to get food, it's not always realistic or feasible, unfortunately. Um, there's a question related to, or a comment, I guess, related to foam, produce, and meat trays. Um, and I know, Stu, I talked to you about this when we first met uh, at a conference a couple of years ago. Here in Florida, certain grocery stores will actually take those polystyrene foam trays and egg cartons back for recycling. I'm not sure how widespread that is. Do you have a feel for how available that is uh, around the country? Uh, I, I'm not, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm not familiar with, um, in terms of the grocery take back for polystyrene, um, but we are definitely seeing um, a greater interest in polystyrene recycling, especially from um, the, the chemical recycling side, so breaking it back down into, um, into styrene. And that's where uh, companies like Agilex out in Oregon um, are trying to get a, a stronger foothold. Traditionally, Polystyrene, when it was recycled, was was densified into a a heavier version of itself uh, instead of the lighter foam meat trays and things like that that you see. And then they would make other products out of it. Um, but more and more, we're seeing an interest in trying to get the polystyrene back to styrene so that it can be used either for the same purpose or for other purposes to make um, different styrene-based uh, products. Uh, so. Not a total answer to your question, but, but certainly there is an interest in trying to do more to capture that material um, and get it recycled. Great. And maybe we can take one more question. Um, and I don't know if, if you know an answer to this one either, but there's a concern about the amount of packaging that is used just in general um, on items that you can buy in stores and the fact that the packaging is often much larger 
than the product that you're buying, um, I guess because the products are displayed in a store and need to be prominent on the shelf and so on. Is the industry taking any efforts to encourage reducing the packaging itself, the size of it? It's a, it's a great question. Um, I, you know, the simple answer is yes. Um, I, I'm not familiar with some of the efforts in terms of big box stores and what have you. Um, typically, we don't see a lot of that like TV boxes and stuff we don't necessarily see becoming um, marine debris. Um, but interestingly, on the if we switch this a little bit more to food packaging, um, there's a challenge that I'm sure everyone has, has run into that many municipalities don't accept black plastics um, in their recycling streams. And the reason for that is that the optical sorter can't see the black to know that it's a plastic product that needs to be um, pulled off and put into a certain bin uh, for uh, for recycling. Not that there's anything um, you know specifically wrong with recycling a black plastic container. It just can't it can't be seen and sorted by the equipment that's uh, that's sorting it. However, a lot of the um, uh, the the retailers like to use black plastic for um, meat, like rotisserie chickens or, or any other kind of meat, because it, it displays the product better. Uh, so one thing that the industry is, is working on developing is a dye um, to mix in with the, that black plastic that could be seen by the infrared scanner so that it can be more easily sorted. Um, so, I, I mean, a, a relatively small change, um, but certainly an awareness is, is growing in terms of how do we make products um, you know, more recyclable? How do we reduce the amount of packaging on uh, various products while also balancing that um, you know, performance and recyclability as, as two of the, the key drivers? Great, well, I wanna thank you, Stu, very much for, for being part of this webinar. Um, I think we've, for the most part, handled all the questions I have grabbed them all um, so that Sue and I can look through them and make sure we did address everything. Um, we have everybody's email address, so if you asked a question that was not completely answered, um, we may be getting back to you with a, an email response. Uh, and I think with that, we will go ahead and wrap up the webinar for today. As I said, it will be recorded. You will be getting a, an email tomorrow containing the link to the, the recorded webinar. And again, I want to thank Stu Harris for participating today. Thank all of you for your questions. And maybe we'll see some of you next week. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Brian.